Tonight is the final session of, uh, the, of Center for Book Arts Fall 2021 online broadside reading series called Black Spirit with a virtual reading uh, from contemporary poet Desiree Bailey and the spirit of his historic poet Kamal Brathwaite, moderated by programs curator Harmony Holiday. This reading is part of a series uh, that has been going on for more than 20 years, and it gives the opportunity to visual artists and poets to work together. Harmony Holiday is a writer, dancer, archivist, and uh, the author of five collections of poetry, including Mafa. We would like to uh, thank our funders. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, and also poets and writers. Special thanks to Kamau's Brathwaite's estate, everyone who donated to support this event, and people who bought the broadside. I just want to remind you that the broadside is still at a special price until the end of the event. Uh, Harmony, welcome, and uh, we can start now. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm excited for this uh, last installment of our series. Um, it's at a great time because there is uh, a sort of mild, I don't even want to call it mild, there's a kind of revolution happening in Barbados right now. And Kamau, whose archive we're going to be listening to, is from Barbados and our poet, Esri, as well. Um, right? Am I? Sorry. Trinidad, but I Trinidad, okay. I do have some, yeah, thought, we all yeah. migrate within the Caribbean. So yeah. got some ancestors from Barbados too. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so I'm excited. And what we're gonna see from Kamau is a little bit of video and then just a recording of him reading um from his book Masks. And it kind of speaks for itself. So We'll just start with that. And it will go um, black when he, after the video clip. So that'll just be like a collective deep listening experience. And you can feel free to comment as well in the chat that's happening. I'm not hearing sound. Oh no, not again. Okay, I'm so sorry. Hold on. Let me try it. Let me try this again. Uh, okay, hold on, everyone, just one second. I'm so sorry for the technical difficulty. I thought it was working during our test run. Yes, it was. I know, I don't know why this keeps happening. All right, okay, let me try one more time. Okay, I think I, I, think I said it so that it will work. Okay. As this bird tries to ascend beyond the metaphorical pull of the earth, persisted, it has persisted in, in every way possible, politically, fragmentation, linguistically, fragmentation, religiously, fragmentation, socially, fragmentation, as if the, the people who inherit that landscape have are walking in the ghosts 
of that original yawn out of Yucatan, which created Atlantis and which created those little Isola, those Isola. Now what happens with Isola is that there's a, a dream, a wish to, for restoration. There's always a dream for restoration, that the mountains should rise once more out of the water and become once more a wonderful cordillera. Or that the people who live on these small islands will reunite with the mainland in some way by building bridges or by migrating, of course, which is the way that we have been following recently, or by imitating the virtues and the non-virtues of that mainland, so that the mainland becomes a kind of mirror for this fragmented society. So we have this dichotomy set up between the two. And, you know, we, when we downgrade our history, when we fail to recognize the nature of it, we are perpetuating that situation where we cannot really properly heal and restore. There are many other factors in there too. For instance, as I said, we never knew growing up, and even today it is still a problematic business about slavery. You know, did we really have slavery? What kind of thing was it? What, what's the nature of it? You know, and what I'm saying is that unless you have a ceremony that recognizes the death of 50 million people, unless you can go out in boats and throw flowers on that ocean, you are encouraging ghosts to haunt you forever. You are encouraging cries in the psychic night. You are encouraging the perpetuation of fragmentation, the difficulty of writing a whole poem, the crippling of the fingers that will create the poem. All of these are the things that the poetry teaches me. This is what I learn as I struggle to find the right rhythm and the right cadences for these things. So that when I talk about the thin asthmatic cow shares the untrashed garage. It's made as a terrible disaster taking place because what the achievement of that simple little village or what appears to be a simple little village which becomes the heart of my poetry becomes the subject of national neglect and often of national contempt. Next door to my grandfather, now before that, just let me show you something else here. Drink, may you rest, for the year has come round again. Kong, 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 kung, 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 funtumi akori, chweni boa akori, chweni boa kodia, kodia chweni duru, odomankuma charimase, odomankuma charimase, oko babia, oko babia, wamani ho meni so. Wamani ho meni so, a koko bonapa, a koko to a bong, a hima hima hima, a hima hima hima, funtumi akori, chweni boa akori, spirit of the cedar, spirit of the cedar tree, chweni boa kodia, oda mankuma charima says, oda mankuma charima says, the great drummer of oda mankuma says, the great drummer of Odomankuma says that he has come from sleep, that he has come from sleep and is arising and is arising like a cock of the cock, like a cock of the cock who clucks, who crows in the morning, who crows in the morning. We are addressing you, Ye Re Cheri Wo. We are addressing you, Ye Re Cheri Wo. Listen, let us succeed. Listen, may we succeed. Gong gongs throw pebbles in the routed pools of silence. News of ripples reach the awakened Zulus. Chaka tastes the salt blood of the bitter Congo. And all Africa is one, is whole. Nim tree shaded in Ghana, in Chad, Mali, the shores of the cooling kingdoms. Beat heaven of the drum. Beat the dark leaven of the dungeon ground where buds are wrapped, twisted round dancing shoots. 
White salt crackles at root lips, bursts like a fist and beats out this prayer. Nana Firimpong, once you were here, hold the earth and left it for me, green, rich, ready with yam shoots, the tuberous smooth of cassava. Take the blood of the fowl, drink, take the ito, mashed plantain that my women have cooked, eat and be happy, drink, may you rest, for the year has come round again. Asasiya, you mother of earth, on whose soil I have placed my tools, on whose soil I will hoe, I will work. The year has come round again. Thirsty mouth of the dust is ready for water, for seed. Drink and be happy. Eat, may you rest, for the year has come round again. And may the year, this year of all years, be fruitful beyond the fruit of your labor. Shoots faithful to tip, juice to stem, leaves to green. And may the knife for the cutlass not cut me. Roots blunt, shoots break, green wither, wind shatter, damp rot, hot harmattan come drifting in harm to the crops. The tunneling termites not raise their red monuments, graves, above the blades of our labor. Summon now the kings of the forest, horn of the elephant, mournful call of the elephant. Summon the emirs, kings of the desert, horses caparisoned, beaten gold bent, archers and criers, porcupine arrows, bows bent. Recount now the gains and the losses, Agadis, Sokoto, El Hassan dead in his tent, the silks and the brasses, the slow, weary tent of our journeys down slopes, dry river courses, land of the lion, land of the leopard, elephant country, tall grasses, thick, prickly herbs. Blow, elephant trumpet, summon the horses, dead horses or losses, the bent, slow bow of the Congo, the watering Niger. My lord, all this time since we left Walata, you have led these people. Are you not tired? I am very tired, Munia. My head aches, my feet are weary. Sometimes the light seems to sing before my face. My blood cries out for rest. But still you won't rest, you won't give up. Can't we stop here? Have we not traveled enough? The young men murmur, El Hassan. The women long for a market where they can chatter and laugh. I know, I know. Don't you think that I too know these things, want these things, long for these soft things? Ever since our city was destroyed by dust, by fire, ever since our empire fell through weakened thoughts, through quarreling, I have longed for markets again, for parks where my people may walk, for homes where they may sleep, for lively arenas where they may drum and dance. Like all of you, I have loved these things. Like you, I have wanted these things. But I have not found them yet. I have not found them yet. Here the land is dry, the bush brown. No sweet water flows. Can you expect us to establish houses here, to build a nation here? Where will the old men feed their flocks? Where will you make your markets? So must we march all the time? Walk in this thirsty sun all the time. 
there is a land south of here where it is richer. I have heard tales told of the mouths of great rivers that smile, of forests where farms may be broken, deep lakes in these forests, and plains where our cattle may graze, and further on, a place where the water boils white at its whispering edges. White, the water? Hot at its edges? Is it not Nadarina of which the sages speak? Perhaps, perhaps, the weak mind only seeks towards these things in dreams, in cracking sunlight's visions. But I heard the sound of silver running with the clink of water, as if a river were flowing soft and always south from here. For miles the land was brown and dry, for miles clear sky and rock. Three days we traveled, dreaming, heavy tongues dumb, soles and our ankles numb, foreheads shocked with heat. The land was empty, and the rainless arch of nothing stretching stretched straight on. Three days we traveled, in steps knotted, cords of our thighs flesh frayed and muscles afraid of the next hot step, the next hot slipping stone. Three days we traveled to that low sky morning when we saw the mist Gray sticking breath, nosing the blind earth. Heard the whisper, knew the ground now soft and softer, growing grassed and greener, till we reached the white river. Not since the mighty rule of Nana Nyankapong began had such excitements happened in our town. Chiefs' sandaled feet that never once had known the ground jumped from their palanquins and ran. Stools overturned, noon's rule began. Women, moon servitors, cool waters thought songs of before the forest dried, vanished underground. Blood ruled, and my cut tribe, wailing like flutes, whipped for their weakness, brought to this red tongue. For the tribe's sake, the priest cried, die. For the stool's honor, shrine's wealth, lean slaver's health of money. Do not seek to find in the smoke's mask of battle your own face, coward's eyes, truth of fear. For the tribe's sake, the priest cried, die. Let the tongue's lips labials rot withering words in the hot wind. If you must speak, wear a black mask of silence, asking no elder to lead you again through the leaves, through the pathways of prayer, to Anyami's now leafless air. For I am the life of my people. Like the cock, I produce shocks of life. Like the hen, I bear eggs when the cycle is ripe. White salt, tasteless soul body, red yolk where the meaty heart beats. And when the cycle is ripe, I, giver of life to my people, crack open the skull, skill of shell, carefully carved craft of bones, and I kill. So for my hacked heart, veins memories, I wear this past I borrowed. History bleeds behind my hollowed eyes. On my wet back, tomorrow's sunlight dries. Welcome your brother now, my trapped, curled tongue still cries. And I return, walking these burnt-out streets, brain-limping pain, massed in this wood straw and thorns, seeking the dirt of the compound where my mother buried the thin breeding worm that grew from my heart to her sorrow. Somewhere under gravel, 
That black cord of death still clings to the earth's warmth of glints, jewels pressures, spinning songs of the spider, Kweku Anansi who gleams in the darkness and captures our underground fears. But my spade's hope, shattering stone, receives dumbness back for its echo. Beginnings end here in this ghetto. Firm fingers of shadow unmask me. My navel string screams. Can you hear, can you hear me, blood's tissue? Curving issue of cheek, bone wrapped with breath, eyes I remember so well. Why did our gold, the sun sun sun, safe against termites, crack under the white gun of plunder, bright bridgehead of money, quick bullets bribe? Why did the gods tool you gave us a nochi, not save us from pride, foreign tribes' Bibles, the Christian God's hunger, eating the good of our tree, flesh of my brother's flesh, torn to feed ships, prophet sea. Too proud, too loud in our white teeth of praises, too rich, too external, too ready with all ceremonial, The years remain silent. The dust learns nothing with listening. Feet return to the stone, pain of pathway. Homeless departer who stumbles on dark. No longer hear the wood cracking, blue cooking smoke snapping my anger of roads, sweating thickets. My sisters sip silence. Brothers no longer notice. My stool, tilted sideways, forgets slowly the slow pressing shape of my presence. The termites' dark teeth, 300 years working, have patiently ruined my art. Dam, dam, damirifa. Damirifa doe, damirifa doe, damirifa doe, doe, doe. Dam, dam, damirifa. Damirifa doe, damirifa doe, damirifa doe, doe, doe. Whom does death overlook? Whom, whom does death overlook? I am an orphan, and when I recall the death of my father, Water from eyes, from my eyes, falls upon me. Dam, dam, damirifa. Damirifa due, damirifa due, damirifa due, due, due. Dam, dam, damirifa. Damirifa due, damirifa due, damirifa due, due, due. I am an orphan, and when I recall the death of my mother, Water from eyes, from my eyes, falls upon me. We walk, we walk, we walk, Nana Tano, and it will soon be night. So, Nana Tano, if I am going away now, you must help me. Death, dumb-speaking God mutters for me. Deafness listens, green hearing eyes see. Exiled from here to seas of bitter edges, whips of white worlds, stains of new rivers, I have returned to you. Not Chad, the Niger's blood or Benin's burning bronze can save me now. You I depend upon, Onyami's eldest son. How have I failed who only needed friends' quick eyes to share the terror? How have I failed who only tried to dare the ships, slow journeys whips? Who speaks to me of error? We walk, we walk, we walk, Nanatano. 
and it will soon be night. And it will soon be night, Nanatano, when the dry seed cracks and the new star splits into darkness, when the drum sticks bend and the drummer climbs out of the darkness, buttocks balance the earth, spine fuses the drum beats to movement, lights twinkle to life in their root tips, the tree rises again, and you rise with its trunk and its movement of branches, Leaves hear again what the distance is saying, and my memory bends, curves, nods head and crouches, feeding the dust at the soles of its feet as it dances. Asasiya, earth, if I am going away now, you must help me. Divine drummer, Cherima, if time sends me walking that dark path again, you must help me. If I sleep, you must knock me awake. And as the cock now cries in the early dawn, so slowly, slowly, ever so slowly, I will rise and stand on my feet. Slowly, slowly, ever so slowly, I will rise and stand on my feet like a cock of the cock, like a cock of the cock who cries, who cries in the morning, a cock of bonapa, a cock of to a bon. I am learning, let me succeed. I am learning, let me succeed. Thank you to Kamal. Uh, more than any poet almost that I've heard read, I feel like he really reads um, as I experience jazz, almost like sheets of music, which is why, although I've mixed him with music before, I decided kind of not to because he was such a lover of that music and theorized so much about jazz and calypso and rhythm. And then for someone to be able to channel it and have like such a lilting musical voice, it's pretty, it's pretty rare, I would say, as far as readers go. Um, I'll just read this quick passage before I introduce Desiree from his book, Roots. He was also a theorist and he, this is a great book if you can find it. Um, Words then are the notes of this New Orleans music. As George Lamming put it at the first international conference of Negro writers in Paris in 1956, for the writer, his private world is his one priceless possession. It is precisely from this point that everything will proceed. Nothing can take its place. It is his initial capital. He may gain by it or lose by it, but without it, he cannot function. Why he should be possessed in this way is a matter one does not wholly understand. We must accept it as part of his experience, but, but is, it is this possession which is responsible for his relationship to words. Um, I feel like Kamau kind of embodies that because he, throughout his, uh, he has like, I don't know, 30 books, but he is obsessed with a lot of the same themes and his private world sort of just like terraforms um, his own earth through those themes, I think, in a way. One of them being family and another one being sort of actually the way the earth is actually formed and the way those islands are formed. And it's just really beautiful to watch if you're if you get a chance to deep dive into his work. And in that lineage, we have um, with us Desiree. Um, I'm super excited. I, this is my first time hearing you read, and I'm very excited for that. Um, and so Desiree C. Bailey is the author of What Noise Against the Cane, Yale University Press 2021, which won the 2020 Yale Younger Poet Series and was a finalist for the National Book Award this year. Woo -woo. <laughs> um, get it. 
Anyways, <laughs> she's also the author of a fiction chapbook, In Dirt or Salt Water, published in 2016 by A Clock Press. Desiree is from Trinidad and Tobago and Queens, New York. She currently lives in Providence, Rhode Island. And very excited for this day. Harmony, harmony. Thank you so much for that and for really giving us this chance to sit with Kamal Brockwaite's words and the archive. I think it's interesting. Sometimes these videos are available to us, sometimes not, but we may not always seek them out. And so I felt like just sitting, listening to that was really significant to me and listening together in this communal experience and I feel like I'm still gathering myself because I I am feeling all of the things right now um and I'm 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 really happy about that I feel really full um and also I feel really proud I feel really proud to to hear the legacy that Brockweight has left behind and and to know that there are so many of us writing out of uh out of that creation out of those creations really and i feel really proud to be in his or of his lineage um i'm going to read from what noise against a cane and my mind is in so many places i'm like what what am i going to read for harmony for brothwaite and i will start with um what I call the sea voice, which is a line of text that runs along the, the bottom margin of the entire book. And I'm gonna start a little timer just so that I can keep track of myself here. Crow does fly high, but when he come down, ants does eat all the eye. And the breeze keep on blowing like she never even know crow name. And the ants love meat when it's sweetened by a great fall. Hear how the rain make music in the bones. Hear how she drum on the remains before washing it into my wide, wet mouth. My body spread out, squeezing the coast like a jammet. Yes, I's a jammet, I'm a chin up high. Drink and be cunt, drunk, drink and wow. drown, sinking down in my boneyard. But you have to come correct when it come to me. You have to touch me, praise me, treat me like a queen. So bring the duck, white roses, white wine, and honey. Sweeten up my pump, make my belly feel good. I hear doing me, flowing how it does always flow. But everybody does do what they want with me. Say that I see Maya and Mizuchi and how Vina shell out herself from me. Say my body is all kind of king and beast. Even Miss Ting, Miss Poet, who thinks she writes in me here. Give me this voice like a voice that she afraid to forget. Syntax cut up and ring up with shadow Benny and Congo pepper. So I go take the voice and make it sing. Make it roar like a hit in the peak of my pleasure. But oh God, that child is worried. That poet does turn and turn. She mind worse than a wave. This next, so I mean, it goes on and on and on, and it's commenting on me. <laughs> it's commenting on on what's happening in the sea, what's happening on the land, um, and uh, it lives with the other poems of of the of the book. And so, uh, one of the long or the long poem of the book is called "Chant for the Waters and Dirt and Blade," and in this poem. I, so I'm thinking through the Haitian revolution, but also thinking through the rule of the sea and the spirits of the sea, and in particular, Mami Water, La Sirene as well. And um, every time I read this, I kind of jump around because it is, it's, it's like half of the book. Um, and so I think I'll do a, a bit of jumping around here too. I am I but I won't spill my name. Not here on this damned rock pushed out bloody from the bowels of the sea. Marketplace island where the clouds crest and birdsong all for sale. 
profit of my black, my stewed puss on the plate in the belly of my captor. What am I? What dare I? Grease up to quiet the squeak, a howl camouflage destined to burst forth. Murderous as a wave, meek today, tomorrow cupped for my inheritance of rage. My name soldiers up like bile, but I dare not allow it, swallow it, bury it down with the other human parts of me. I husk of girl, orphan at the ocean's distant edge, before ship before humid choke of hull, before trade winds splintering me off into the world's directions, a girl, an eye, unbroken and spotless, smooth as obsidian's kiss. Until I can eat what my hands have made, I am a castaway, a hound's hound tied up, skin nor down, gleam of bone in the arrowed sun. What kind of life we do and do till, clear, dig, grind, months, years, measured by cane, melody of home, a ruthless drift, a song that doesn't return. I dream the sea scabbed over, a hush across her blue-black lips, the scaled mother below, circling, swimming the wound, the scaled mother hurling her body against the crust of hurt, pickaxe of tail and spine until there an opening. Oh, my forgetful, singed love, our sea is not, can never be the wound. We shadows beneath shadows, stone interred in stone, I somebody, I daughter of seagrass. I don't always remember, when the hole flings its dirt against the coming dark. Oh, horizon and deep sky hex me to be sexless like the mermaid hunkered into her scales. A shut sweetness I am not offered, the cool privacy of fish. I see no use for all these doors if they do not serve me first. I envy the stone, the ordinary shoe. Somehow I more object than they. Knowing line in the sky, salt and dry me, fuse me out of use. My hands, my womb, whittle to a tool. To build what? A white man's skull temple his leaning empire of ash and bone, his coffee, his cane arrows towards the death of everything. The land chewed up, the skinned forests, his god within the vulture's jaw. The island made into a wicked stain, a lump in the throat of my mother. But if not here, then where, crude shadow of home, my blood, my grief glistens the soil. The land and me stubborn kin. The land made me a new being, forged of a greedy flame. My blood already here. My gods breathing in the hills, in the slow tilt of evening. My gods stir me into a battle song. My muck, my cane, my muddy island, my life, my death, my cliffs, my body's bloom. What smoke? What threadbare cry, what child strung between, what architect of light, what leaf of the wound, what mountain and scar, what keloid, what mother, what sweat in the eye, what sojourning soul, what thrust in the dark, what hole, what belly, what babe without breath, what root to the hills, what dance, what drum beat to call, what freedom, what body, what precipice of hope. What danger, what master, what whalebone, what poison meat, what pillage field, what noise against the cane, what blaze, what sky, what name to call myself. And so the second half of the book, I see that I'm still good on time. Uh, the second half of the book is... Uh, set I guess more contemporary and set uh during this time and um and so I'll read a bit of that I'm gonna try to uh let's see okay I'll just go 
go with it. This is called guesswork. True, there's no homeland, just my vain feet wandering the shore, marring paradise, regretful inconvenience. I am smudge in the eye of a tourist camera. Vagrant is what I learned to call the man with snarl of sky for a roof. And how now that word turns inward, taking root within the spleen. I am not lost, or am I? Light a white candle, says a friend, his pupils storming within mine. Neighbor it to a glass of water, flame and water to uncover a path, to greet the ones who walked moons before. Damn near atheists on so many days, but I touch the flame to the wick and my head is light, light, it's lifting, diasporan daughter raking the soil for a map a glint of my mama's gold, a bone to call my own. See me, saga gal and kente pum pum shorts, thigh shape buttered fulani hoops twisting a secret beside my face. I fix my mouth to say black girl. I twist my tongue to say magic. Yet when the day turns, I scorn this empty bellied scavenging, the traditions fumbled, then swirled to mud. I want to say I am from nowhere and everywhere, but that feels coy like I'm lifting my skirt for the empire's gaze, even if it is true. On my papers and certificates, there's a country and another country. I can reach beyond, trace the soils through a strand of hair or swab of cheek, but what after? Forever of lineage riven and ruptured, so I search only because I can. And sometimes I exist more and more each day, a brown cotton doll stuffed and stitching the X for her own inadequate eye. This poem is called Woman in Dub. And um, this is actually one of my like favorite poems to read, although I haven't read it in a while. And it's after Lee Scratch Perry, um, the legendary Jamaican dub producer who has really influenced so much of not only dub and reggae and dance hall, but hip hop as well. And, um, and he actually recently passed, I think, and Harmony can jump in here, but maybe a few months ago, right? Yeah. Um, and so this is after his song, Chase the Devil, and there's also a, a version with Max Romeo. And, and one thing in this poem, uh, this was when I, I guess I was really like listening to a lot of dub and I, my uh, sort of obsession and fascination with it has a lot to do with, uh, with the structure of it, the looping, the reverb, the echoes, and um, I really wanted to have fun with the form of this and, and to sort of uh, see if I could <laughs> attempt <laughs> to do in a poem what Dub does. Side A. The devil I see is the one I saw and nail out of fears, out of cycles of wound, dread calcifying into prophecy. I put on an iron shirt to face it, chase it, but the cup still pissed drunk with power. I put on an iron shirt, but the men on the streets surveil the nipple. Been hounding my punani since before I spilled my first blood. What a menace of a body I hurl blame to the husk. Is the devil real or is it of my fantastical making? The answer is not the matter. The fact of paranoia be the true violence. Warfare, the very presence of the question. I want to peer inward to take a good look at the sound system, my heartbeat echoing out of my folkloric thirst, my desperate belief in, a belief in other realities, a B-side where I'm abolished from emotional labor, AKA black woman's burden, free to surrender to my own madness, to sink down into the dub of it, stripped of my first voice, 
reverbing outside the pain of a body. Side B, stripped of my first voice down in the dub, cop hounds my blood into paranoia, a black reality, cycle spilled, power hush, emotional woman, I, I, I iron, real street, folkloric and mad, tr tr true. Take a good look at the devil, peer into the dread, men surrender to wound drunk, calcified, but I fantastic, chasing echoes, nail to system, free in sound, I a fact, answer of my own making. And actually, um, speaking of the sonics, and because I'm also so obsessed with what Harmony Holiday does uh, with the sound on the page. And uh, so I, I think I'm trying to reach for like my most, you know, <laughs> rhythmic stuff in this moment. This is a poem uh, that I rarely read. I think um, to be quite transparent because I, there was a moment where I felt that maybe people would kind of misconstrue what I'm doing with this poem, but I recently decided, let me, let me trust the people. And so this is called Ofeo Negro Black Orpheus after the film. And um, I have feelings about it. I, I like the film, but I also have feelings about it. So um, anything else I need to say? Nope. <laughs> Poor blacks, sweet blacks, molasses smeared and sticky blacks, blacks in favela erect, hoisted high in scorch hills, blacks in blue, in white, in yellow dresses, blacks yielding kites to the wind, serene blacks, toothless blacks, beige brown, black blacks, blacks nested in hammocks being tropical blacks, blacks hawking squid and onions, hustling blacks, cans of oil on their heads, blacks, black summoning sun from sea, slit throat rooster, blacks, blacks, haze in lust in lazy, heat dust, blacks, spice blacks, watermelon blacks, water dog, sailor blacks, black swirling gold thread for carnival, starfall blacks, star cross blacks, blacks busting through bass relief, bossa nova blacks, glistening blacks, mass blacks, blacks in pretty painted shacks, crucifix blacks, nightfall blacks, shadow blacks, tristeza, the sadness so sweet it rots black. I too from masquerade land, Asphalt sputtering, chomping on plastic beads and feathers, costumes re-singing histories of the flesh. My island, a speck, a globe of spit slipping past the eye of the world. So I watch Ofeo Negro greedy for a glimpse of myself, a skip trick of light splayed out on the screen. My greed, my open mouth cares not for taste. I am almost ashamed. I want to be looked upon as the world looks upon Erdice. Delicate the way her pistol sways in the breeze. Oh, thirst of commerce ever sucking despite force of flow pitching our flesh from port to port aren't we charmed and exquisite dancing as we've always danced drenched in our cane taint swig of dawn orchids exhale hounds the cliff cameras invitation see the bodies framed by fronds of paradise no space for my morning. The dirge is drowned in the bay. Children twist limbs to dance, hoisting the sun with guitar strings. No space for my Orfeo gone. Eridici dissolved in the plucked refrain where a black falls, another dances up from the soil. Happy blacks, cycle of blacks kicking up dust.
And I'm going to read one more, which is the last poem in the book. And um, so the first long poem is called Chant for the Waters and Dirt and Blade. And this is called Chant for the Waters and Dirt and Blade, Slight Return. A memory of the cemetery flooded with the muma of the living, the candles, small fires nesting on the graves. My grandfather and we, his thin-limbed offspring every year in the humid dark. Each All Saints Day, the mosquitoes rising from the grasses to feed. Every year we light, we pray that our dead will not forget the chant below our skins. The scent of melting wax will always call forth the memory of our dead. The unheard footfalls, the bodiless rustling through the dashing leaves. On this Hollow's Eve, I am listening to the cars sounding their grievances on Flatbush Avenue, while hemming words in my apartment, wishing that I could wake up tomorrow in my first country to visit what remains of my grandfather, to go to him, to the cemetery of his mother, his father, and the wax riding the damp air, its fragrance winding beyond the dark palm print of a bacano tree. Who, what, how do I believe? My worship colonized, my gods painted in a foreign face, my grief song milked in the raised woods shipped off most wanted commodity. I stuff my ears against the old spirit's call, fearful of the way the past speaks to me. I cling to cold reason, but find empire's grasp, especially there. I believe in what makes me free. I believe in the red hot flowers crowning the head. Oh, that's the time, I guess. Oh, you go. <laughs> I'll finish the poem. I believe in what makes me free. I believe in the red hot flowers crowning the head of the flamboyant tree. I believe in nutmeg ground down for cassava pone and the hands of firm singing hands that push its measurements through the decades. My goddess is the wave unsheathing, my name strung through the conch's contralto. Where will we live, I ask my ocean-torn love. Where will we raise our children if my fibroid womb will allow we of many soils, we who know the curse is the blessing, is the curse, we of many and no homes, we who destroy and build, who send our love haunts along the currents. Whether quick clapping of hands or hymns of lambs and mercy or fistful of cowrie thrown across a mat or psalms to tread the lion and the cobra or symbols drawn in cornmeal guarded throughout the brutal passage. I fear that I will never be fully at home, that the very first leaving cracked the skull of my belonging that when I eventually stop moving, I won't understand the land's grieved tongue. I brown the sugar in the heavy bottom pot to fill up every space to remind myself of language. I belong to the foam that singes the sand where I was thrown to the waves just weeks into the world, my eyes widening to limestone cliffs to see almonds ripening upon the shore. My are the scarlet ibises soaring the salt wash dawn, cleaving the sky open like a blade. Okay. Just like the, even just the intensity might have conjured it, but like the, speaking of being proud, like I'm proud of how these events have paired and how they seem to have like had this accretion quality. You were at Jason's uh, last time. And so it's like, I don't know. I feel like they built on each other really well. And I feel like specifically this time there was this precise call and response that I was going for um, between you and Kamau, like it just really made me think a lot about what he talks about with nation language and the way he theorizes nation language and how, um, you know, as opposed to what's called like patois or dialect where they're, those words are sort of dismissive connotatively and saying like, this is a bastardization of the, you know, the vaulted English language, which we all know is not, is too vaulted 
for what it actually offers us. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is the difference between hearing you read and seeing you on the page is so vast because of the musicality of your reading in a way that if you're not speaking a nation language, if you don't have that skill, which is almost like a skill in music, like playing the voice like an instrument, we don't get that in mainland English speaking uh, life. And I think that's why, like when your poem about Ofeo Negro and just seeing yourself in that, I think the American born diaspora men and women, like we are looking for ourself in language and the closest thing that um, we hear it in is I think from the islands in a way because we don't speak uh, African languages. And so, yeah, it's really powerful to just hear it being mirrored back to you like oh like this is how like this is what you're saying about uh, you know you've seen what I do on the page with rhythm is just trying to get to something like that it's funny also you mentioned Lee Perry because I was gonna play I'm like can I just I had like clips of him I was gonna put in and my stuff was glitching so much like it didn't end up there but I was just like should I put Lee Perry it just felt right you know because they're what? in competition yeah so it makes sense that he comes up also but now I know how we're both, I didn't know you were as obsessed with music as I am. So we're gonna have to do a lot more. I mean, yes, <laughs> please, talking, yeah. listening, vibing, all of that. And um, you bring up nation language and it's, it's something that I was definitely thinking about while I was working through these poems, thinking about, well, how, how do I, like, which voice do I speak in? Which way do I present myself? And, and what does that actually mean? And I think about how, I think we all do this, but like my context is, is well, part of my context is Trinidadian and thinking about the different ways in which people speak. If, you know, if you're presenting, if you're a news reporter and you're presenting on TV, or you are in some official capacity and then how you would speak to your friend versus your mother versus when you are at church. And I, I you know, I think it's important to, to try to capture all of those nuances and, and also in a very like Broadway Ian <laughs> kind of way to, to try to, I think exercise that that stigma from the intimate ways in which we speak to each other. And so I really think about um, his essay, The History of the Voice, and where he's talking about that very thing. He's talking about nation language. He's talking about the choice in, in that we have in how to actually speak and how to work through our art and what that may say about us and what that may say about our relationship to the land but also to the colonizer and um and how we can imagine ourselves in the future so there's that you know that phrase the hurricane that or that quote that that i think is so famous now of his mm -hmm. at least it's famous for me the hurricane does not roar in pentameter and that has been like a guiding yeah. kind of principle for me. Yeah. Um, I think as I kind of like try to navigate my own poetics. And so I, I don't know, I just feel so full to yeah. be here and to be in the presence of this literary ancestor, really. So thank you, Harmony, for this. Well, thank you. I mean, you're definitely continuing the lineage in a way that I did not know with the voice until I heard you read and so it's really dope to hear it in that way uh, back to back um and yeah also just a good reminder like that quote you said which um definitely like I think that's what people pull from him a lot but we are sort of exiled from whatever is called linguistics in the west in a way like it's we're meant to master the language as black and brown writers but not theorize the language definitely not re-theorize it maybe to mimic and echo theories that already exist but he was really going in part of his poetic project just writing poems and then part of his like theory work was to go in and say no I'm also going to talk about the language and I'm going to gossip about 
the language and call you on your bullshit, you know? And like, we, I don't think we do that enough. And that's something that I have always had in my spirit to do. Like, hmm, this isn't working though. Mm -hmm. So if we change this, if we change this in spoken text, we can also change this in writing. Like even for me, something just experimenting with space on the page, I see it come out. He's actually someone who gave me permission to do that because he would experiment so much with script and it teaches you and instructs you how to re-see and reimagine what a poem should, because for so long it's like, yeah, pentameter only, these stanzas need to be neat and compact in this way. And it might have nothing to do with your experience. And so, I don't know, it's just, it's nice to hear, to hear what that does to the voice when you're reading it, because I can't achieve it in the same way that someone with the nation language can. So yeah, I'm proud mm -hmm. <laughs> to have heard it back to back. Although I, I do I do think that Black Americans have a nation language too. For yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I think the the issue is like maybe channeling what he might say is like landmass. It's just that we are contiguous states and we are on this, you know, enclosure. So I feel like it's more enclosed, like we haven't uh free the voice in the same ways and if we have it's something we always try to then go back and uh subdued you know so there's there's a lot more code switching um and I've always just admired I think because of having a dance background I just admire the embodiment of Caribbean life and that might be my own American Black American fetishization of what I think Caribbean life might be but mm. I don't know if it's that I think I just said like even if you look at someone like Rihanna, who's obviously like a pop version of that, you know? And who's now a, a hero. Yeah. By, yeah. by Mia Motley of Barbados. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess better her than the queen. I don't even know. There's a lot going on, right? Like there's, there's also like a billionaire class that she shares with the queen. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, who gets to be a hero, you know, who's like Kamau is more of a hero to me personally I, I was she, thinking about that you feel me yeah, yeah. but I think I I always but think of, I mean Mia Motley in true like politician fashion is like you know what let's put a spotlight on our country by bringing this that this person who has a spotlight yep and I think that's beautiful and Rihanna like I love Rihanna like you, it's hard to not love Rihanna but um but yeah, it just it is what it is. Also, I think it's good to reappropriate the, rem, to remind Americans that she's not American, you know, that um, mm -hmm. she doesn't belong to like the United States because that's easy to forget. Mm. Um, and maybe also Jamaica as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Like I think there was like a campaign like recently. <laughs> they were like, let's confuse everyone and tell everyone that Rihanna's Jamaican. <laughs> so. Jamaican. And in the weird like royal bloodline thing that is somehow in human DNA somewhere, it matters now that she's allegedly pregnant. Um, oh. So, you know, it's like who, there's an heir being born. And so we need to clarify where that, I don't know, there's something about that that just is in human nature. Um, wow. I mean, it's Aesop Rocky's kid, but <laughs> I can leave that part out. Wow. <laughs> learning lots tonight uh, um, <laughs> but like you yeah. talked about um you talked about so like the sonics right but also the visual and how yeah. I like I feel the same way that Brothwaite has instructed me how to sort of or not how to organize myself on the page but but to to play around with that space, to play around with the white space, to completely disrespect the white space yep. <laughs> at times, right? And 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 I I I feel so liberated by that. Like I think about Brothwaite alongside Emma Bessie Phillip in that way, that uh, we can sort of chart new pathways on the page and and have that kind of mirror our lived experiences, mirror even a history that we're still trying to uncover and still trying to refamiliarize ourselves with. And, um, and so I feel like I'm still trying to learn about something that 
that uh, he talked about or that he called tidalectics, which is like this, I guess, relationship of the ocean to the land and that being mirrored in one's movements and, and one's yeah. relationships, how you relate to each other, how you relate to words. So that's something that that I'm really thinking about, about, about the land showing up in how we express ourselves both in our poetry but again in, in how we speak to each other and um even just listening to to this archive whoo like i i was <laughs> i had chills yeah. i was in tears a lot of the like one thing that i admire about brothwaite is his scale and so he zooms out to assess the nation and to assess the nation's relationship to to empire to the colonizer he's looking he's he's looking and thinking globally he's also thinking nationally but then in the same vein and also like looking at this huge timeline of history and in the same vein then he zooms in and he's he's looking at like the texture of a particular fabric of silk or of madras or he's talking about someone sweeping away dust oh my, yeah the yeah that like whew, the range yeah it's it is it's almost like a he has a camera and a like and a metronome going at the same time it's like he's working yeah he it's kind of miraculous when you hear it because it all comes together like it puts you in a sort of trance and then when he got to the part where he's talking about his father that's when I was done it's hard to work with his archives because you do end up crying <laughs> like you're like damn come out what the hell but he's talking about he says it's he'll go so subtly from something so broad to his eyes being wet like he's mm -hmm. talking about the water one second and then all of a sudden he's an orphan with wet eyes and you're like not ready Ooh. for the ocean to turn into his eyes you know I was not um, ready and that looping yeah. of like eyes, my eyes, like it, it's yeah. almost like a stutter at first. Yeah. And then, and then it comes back again and you're like, no, like, again, this is him enacting a musicality onto that poetic line. And so, oh, I'm just in my feelings right now. <laughs> Another thing you and him both do really well is looping without being corny, because I think there is a Western sense of repetition that's like very cerebral. Like if you just repeat it, it has that, you know, that value of like flooding or maybe like tidal, um, tidalectic type feeling of like mm -hmm. actually building on itself, but not all repeating builds on itself. Some repeating falls totally flat or plateaus. And I think for whatever reason, which is definitely technical and also just feeling like that feel for how repetition can work at a slant so it actually works, mm -hmm. which is what musicians have when they're looping too, I think. And something I definitely strive for, but I think it's a very natural cadence in the nation languages coming from the Caribbean mm -hmm. and something that over here, for, you know, the life over here, it's very like factory. It's not like we've never seen a mango fall or we haven't, we haven't lived that maybe tidalectic for lack wow. that's such a great word but we don't know that experience of a certain kind of tropical truth as uh Caetano yeah. Veloso calls it uh we we don't see it even if you're living in the most um verdant part of the U.S. you're not seeing you just don't have that connection and you can see it you know even in watching footage of Carnival even like Rihanna at Carnival it's like damn, like I've taken African dance classes all my life and there's like a permutation of like a hip flip that you'll just never have unless you've lived in a certain place, period. Mm -hmm. I don't care what anyone says. You can kind of get it, yeah. but it's always like an imitative thing. And it's it's part of that looping. Like you describe in one of your poems, like an earring loop, like a secret beside you or something. That was really striking and it captures, I think what I'm trying to. Oh, wow. I never thought about that. Like the, the loop of the airing and then also the, the looping that 
occurs through repetition and through return. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> oh, um, wow. Did we want to talk on the broad side at all? Yeah, I would like yeah. to introduce the two artists. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Bailey and Harmony, for your work. It's been an amazing uh, evening, uh, despite our unfriendly trolls. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, Claudia Cortines. Uh, she's um, a visual artist and educator born in the US to parents from Argentina and Chile and currently living in New York. Her work focuses on recording objects and patterns from urban and domestic spaces, exploring how relationships between architecture, time and memory become physical records. And uh, she was invited to produce Kamau's uh, Brathwaite's um, broadside. And we have a digital image of that broadside to share with you. Hello, Claudia, how are you? Hi, thank you. So do you think you can tell us a little bit about the process and your relationship with the, like with the, with the poem, how you came about? Yeah, um, yeah, first, I mean, it's was, you know, an, an honor to have the opportunity to make the broadside for Kamau's, um, for Kamau's work. It's, I am, yeah, I don't, um, I don't know a lot of his, uh, of his work. I was actually introduced to him from a, um, by a friend and read Middle Passages. And I think the thing that stuck with me <clears throat> was like some of the things that um, you all have been kind of bringing up of this, like the play with language and like translation and like themes of, of distance and, um, I don't know, that was something that really stuck with me. And yeah, it was, I mean, um, you know, we basically got the like approval to work with, uh, with this poem in, you know, pretty sh short recent notice. So, um, which is, I mean, it's amazing that it, that it happened. And um, I, so I actually, yeah, I think so. Like the things that I responded to in this um, in the text selection, which uh, Harmony, you selected this this excerpt, right? Yeah, um, it's just, I mean it's super beautiful, and like the first things, and also just from what I know of um, of Kamal's work was like thinking about how he describes um, like how he describes the land and um, you know islands and the the reference of the volcano and so I immediately knew that I wanted to use um knew that I wanted to use an image uh from some photographs that I took on Easter Island which is I was there doing a project just because like the experience there and um you know it's just like basically you know that's a space where you're 2,000 miles away from Chile which I mean now Easter Island is Rapa Nui is part of Chile um, so I started off with an image, you know, and now it's, it could kind of be a rock from, from anywhere, but it was like a fragment of the edge of a, of, um, the crater of one of the volcanoes in Easter Island. Um, so that's where I kind of started with this, um, the image that's repeated in the, um, in the broadside. And, um, yeah, I guess something for me with like, I really, and with my own, uh, work process. I like have an idea, I make kind of a plan for it. And then a big part of, um, I don't know, I feel like I really connect to the actual print in the printing process. So this is just because we had a short turnaround for like when the poem was approved and getting, um, getting all of that aligned, the, um, the print hasn't actually been made yet. This is a digital mock-up. So like, some things in the process of selecting the color, like, you know, might shift slightly. Um, but the idea was to do the print on, so this like the brown color that's in the background is um, 
addressing the fact that it will be printed on a like a craft um like a heavier weight craft paper which is like something I was thinking about um it's just like this really kind of everyday like super cheap uh paper you know that's used to like wrap like objects and meat and like it's also something um that there's a Chilean artist Eugenio Ditborn that I really love and he's like airmail painting uh like screen print series um that he like prints a lot on this like kind of craft brown paper um so I was kind of a little bit inspired by uh, by that so that's what the prints will be made on this um uh on this brown paper and um yeah that's I don't know that's kind of it for right now. Okay, Claudia, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, uh, Desiree's broadside was printed, well, uh, was uh, designed and printed by Ronnie Gross. She's um, a book artist and uh, instructor at CBA. And she couldn't be with us today, but she recorded a little uh, video uh, commenting on the connection and relationship she had during this process with Desiree and the reading of the of the poem. So we can't hear it. Thank you very much. Um, I was very interested to work with this excerpt from uh, Desiree Bailey's book that is called What Noise Against the Cane? And she submitted three excerpts. Um, and this is called Chant for the Waters and Dirt and Blade. And the word chant was very evocative for me, and I felt like I wanted to set up some sort of a rhythmic structure in which you could experience her language. And so there are two layers of paper. Uh, and if I turn it with the light, you can see that there is a pattern scored onto the top sheet uh, of triangulated lines. And then, you, you know, if you were close to this, you could see through it a little bit to the behind sheet. Um, so I felt that the triangulated lines set up a kind of a rhythmic pattern as you would expect a chant to have. And um, her, some of the words that she used in the poem, like smoke, architect of light, scar, hole, breath. They had a very tactile atmospheric quality to me. And I wanted you, the reader, to experience that both in the sound of the paper as you move it, and also to imagine that this paper, if it was folded along those lines, would have an undulation like water would have. And the reason that there are two layers is because I was thinking about this as existing in kind of a mythic time and that you were going lower, lower, lower into it. And so you barely see the underneath part when you're looking from, from the top layer and then you, it gets revealed when you lift it up. So I wanted you to feel like you are going back in time and perhaps even down into water. Um, and so I asked Desiree um, if there was anything that she wanted to tell me about this poem because I felt that this was existing in some sort of, um, I didn't know where it was placed in time, in place, anything. And so I'm just gonna read you what she said to me. 
She said the entire long poem takes place during the Haitian revolution and thinks through possibilities of freedom and ownership of self, especially for an enslaved black woman. It also deals with themes of longing for home, the body and ecology. And the last line of the poem is what name to call myself. So I hope that I have done justice to this by giving it a place to live that is kind of a multi-sensory um, mythic place to reside. Well, that's very beautiful. Um, now I don't know if how many people are in, but if anyone would like to join in and um, ask questions, comment, maybe um, join in for a bit, or we can finish here if there's no questions. Let's well, see. unfortunately, people can't turn on their videos or mics. Oh, but maybe oh, they, can, <laughs> they, they can. They uh, can. Put yeah, your questions in in the chat. Yeah, if you if you want to drop it in the chat, please do so now. So in the meantime, Harmony, I would like to ask you, um, like your decisions to choose these three um, uh, ancestors, um, how how did you how are you like um, making this curatorial decision? what uh, moves you to put each of them in that order and also the relationship with these um, uh, uh, contemporary poets. I really just feel for the work and how they, like the resonances between the contemporary poets and the ancestral poets. Um, and in some cases really clear, like the lineage between Desiree and Kamau is pretty, Clear, you know, I feel like there's kind of an echoing that we experienced. And then with Kyle and Amiri, I was thinking more in terms of uh, the Cuba experience and those roots. Um, and with Jason and I, kind of like the, the fierce snappingness of both of their temperaments. Um, so it was kind of like temperament and vibe, cadence, texture. And yeah, just how it would feel, right? I don't think it could have gone. I mean, I definitely, it was very clear to me who went where, so yeah. So you would say it was more like finding that relationship between them than actually choosing the, like the, um, this uh, elder poets to, to uh, for a specific reason? I chose them, I mean, because I like their work also. So the, the elder poets so it's people who I'm sort of haunted by and listen to their archives a lot or want more of their archives or also mostly in this case because I can do that solo anytime think that those archives lend to like a collective listening experience and because this is the first time that I've structured something exactly like this especially not in person it was also about just um what would lend itself to collective listening that wouldn't be engaging in this platform because I think that we've all been on Zoom a lot and so one of the things that's worked particularly well for me on Zoom has been like listening experiences but just how to weave that in with the reading experience um, and honestly I think it helps the readers because having been on the other side of having done readings and solo readings it can be kind of like lonely even if you have even if it's not a solo reading honestly like if there are a couple readers there's just something about the zoom reading of poetry or of any performance I've talked to my sister who's a singer and has done singing zoom and it's just like kind of cold but there's something to me it seems like it's a little warmer if you have that like accompaniment so that was in part of it okay we have a question here Diane Xavier uh, would love to hear Desiree and Harmony talk a little bit 
more about bothering messing with the white space of the page and maybe thinking about how that translates to the mouth in terms of a trends of the poem. And she also added a little add on at the bottom in the chat, which says, and maybe what it feels like to have the poem return back to a new page in the form of a broadside, which I really like. A question is a poem and Diane, by the way, is uh, a brilliant playwright and poet and her her book, The Math of St. Felix, is out now, and it's phenomenal, and you should all read it. Um, I'm thinking about, I, I love your phrasing, uh, what it feels to have the poem return back to a new page in the form of a broadside. First of all, it was really nice to hear Ronnie speak about the experience of, of, of like sitting with those poems that I sent to Ronnie especially not knowing the context and kind of feeling that um, that there is this mythic time, which is also historical as well. And it, I, I like that kind of that muddying there, because sometimes when we do think about history, it is in a sense in this time that is not immediate and that feels like a myth. Um, and so so I, I love the playing with that. And what Roni said about the about moving to the bottom and and not necessarily seeing what is there immediately and then lifting up that first layer to then have the name of the poem revealed, I thought was really just like a really moving and smart and like fully embodied decision to make as as an artist and i love how that worked in tandem with with all of the things that i'm thinking about the ocean and thinking about what lies beneath and um and what is what is sort of again what is what can be buried what can be dug up all of these things that are happening also the transparency of that first layer there's like i can't wait to actually to feel that broadside because I saw in the chat um, folks were saying that the broadside is actually like you can get a lot more of the nuance when you feel it when you see it in person see and feel in person and also the sound of it too because uh, of those two pages sort of interacting with each other so I cannot wait to hold that I'm still, I don't know if I should answer the fir Diane, your first question, or if I should let Harmony chime in on, on the experience of the broadside first. How are you feeling? Um, I'm thinking about just uh, like the receive, like we receive the size of books, you know, as like a sort of convenience or an efficiency of like capitalist life, like eight and a half by 11, so this is, you know, like you start out with that page and then books are a specific size and, you know, pages are broken kind of crudely based on what fits on the page. And so I love seeing the broad size because it's a lot more intentional with each page. And that's sort of the work. I mean, when we write poems, they are often are singular first. And so it feels like it's sort of like bringing a poem back into that territory of like maybe the subconscious where it lived. And so it's, it's also interesting to see how well a lot of these artists have picked up on that part of the process for a poet and brought it into the visual field. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I think for me, um, this process actually made me realize how much I've let go now that the, the book is done. Mm -hmm. And actually in a conversation that um, that I was having with Diane in an event for her book, I think last week or the week before, another writer, Carlos Serra, asked like, do you feel free now? And I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember it exactly, but like, is the putting out of the book somehow freeing for you? And I felt like I really like struggled through that question because I'm like, I don't know, is it? Um, but, but I, but actually, the the 
like I realized that actually when I gave those poems to Ronnie and said, you know what, like do whatever you want with them. Maybe that was an indication to me that actually I had moved through something and that maybe it's that my obsession really lies with with this book itself and the way in which the poems appear on the page and all of that. Like it had to be just right, just so. And and actually, I didn't feel that way at all with with Ronnie. And I felt like this is actually a new entity and and this is something that you should actually play with and and take forward and to kind of see what resonates with you so for me i think on a kind of personal intimate level it was really good to have that recognition and to have the broadside and the experience of the broadside mark a transition a process and like a point you know that i arrived at And I'm thinking also about, wait, are, is there another? Yeah, was there another part to the question? The other part had to do with the white space mm. and how we're working through the white space. I wonder, Harmony, how are you thinking about the white space? I am thinking about it as I don't, um, I mean, I kind of just, like you were saying before, uh, play in that space. Like, I don't think of it as sacrosanct to completely, you know, make, I, I make really long lines that I don't always consider prose, but because of the limits of our literary language, it's like, it's either prose or it's shrunken into poetry. I don't believe in those dichotomies at all. I believe that lines can be longer, uh, lines can pivot between long and short. Lines can be a lot like music, you know? Um, you think of them as chords more. And I try to play with that a lot because that's just how I hear them. So I feel like the white space is open to interpretation and it's open to like listening to, I don't think. I think a lot of what happens, like Kamau even talks about the beginning of his career going to London or just the beginning of his artistic life like moving to the UK and he I think he wanted to act first and he tried to be in like a Shakespearean play and it was like very I don't know maybe it was the 50s or something and they were like <laughs> they were just like nah but you could sweep the floor and so he was basically like in tears like being like the you know janitor of this theater for a minute and then he got it together and he wrote a poem about the first time he saw snow. I'm like very much paraphrasing some stuff I was listening to while I was making the audio, but he talks about the first time he saw snow. And so he won his first award for like imitating this very British sensibility about the delicacy and the, you know, stark whiteness and pallor of snow. And then for a while he was trapped in this idea that he had to continue to do that kind of thing, you know? Um, and I think that happens to a lot of us. I think a lot of the time, like for me, I've always been a pretty wild, like in that space, but I think some of the times that I was first like invited into poetry workshops, even as an undergrad, it was like, because of things that were a lot more tidy, you know, like knowing when to write a tidier poem or just even knowing like basic uh, utilitarian things, like to publish in a certain magazine, the poem has to fit somewhere between a bunch of essays and so it has to be this length and I really think that we need to start ignoring those things and also forcing the publishing world to ignore those things not in like weird goofy ways either not like this is like an anomalous book because it's this size or this week the New Yorker published a really long line like just make it normal like what is the tidiness of poetry and I think that's what's cool about broadsides it's a reminder like poetry can take up more space and one person that comes to mind with that white space question too is Glenn Ligon that do you know the artist Glenn Ligon um not that he's a poet at all but that he works with language and for when I first saw some of his work installed with language I was kind of I was both inspired and annoyed <laughs> like annoyed in this way because it troubled like 
I'm like, well, wait, because these are like things I think about doing a lot. So am I supposed to like be a poet in museums? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? What is the context for my work if I think on this scale, but then shrink it down to the book scale? And not that I feel like books are shrinking, like I love making books and putting together a series of poems, but like we should be thinking about scale as freely as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that was a really great answer because with Glenn Ligon, I, you know, the language is literally like the materials that, that he's working with. And so, so I, I think there's a lot that we can really learn from that process and also adapt to our own process and it's amazing how resistant some folks in publishing are to us really reworking the white space and so even it's already hard I think for an individual poet to to understand that they can do whatever the fuck they want to do right but uh, but I, especially because of like the like industry of poetry, yeah. it's like, like, who cares? Like, do you gotta stop? Yeah, it's yeah. not fiction, and even yeah. then, you could still you could like yeah. push as much as you can. But you're a poet, you really yeah. can just do what you want to do, but, and we need to more. I feel yeah. like we got in this stage of like very polite, almost like careerism driving the artistic sensibilities, and that is very dangerous like when people thought like poetry was popping off so suddenly you need to like put on the face of poet you know what I mean like very (laughs) very not what poetry is meant to be yeah and and so like even at like by the time we arrive to that realization that like wow this is mine actually and I can really mold it in into a desired shape and play with it and be surprised by it then you you get into like you know, like the formal, I guess, process of publishing. And sometimes people are really nervous. They're like, (laughs) how is this going to work? These lines are really long. You spoke about the long lines. And I didn't really think about that being an issue until like it came to, you know, like turning the manuscript into a physical thing. Suddenly it's like, oh, let's, maybe we we have to cut your lines. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes that can be the first, the first impulse or the first thought is, is, well, how can we, <laughs> the word that came to my mind was like wounds. And I was like, yeah. like how, but <laughs> maybe I'm being dramatic, but how can nah. we alter your language, right? Um, instead of finding a way to actually work with with the richness that you are bringing to mm-hmm. the page. And oftentimes we do have to kind of push to, to, to make that possible and, and for all of our expressions to show up and for us to have those long lines, like maybe we turn the poem sideways so it can yeah. be really long. Maybe we are gonna put this, you know, this like uh, this tale or this story or this lamentation in the margins or, or wherever it will be. Maybe the poem becomes like a, a fugitive kind of movement in how it refuses to adhere to to like a straight sort of expected form on the page. So I'm here for the poets playing and experimenting and resisting and and really using the page and the white space as a place to discover ourselves. And won't it be amazing in like 20 years when we've decided that lines need to be longer and there's a whole form named after it and the books are bigger. Instead of always thinking about, you know, your line doesn't fit on the page, why are books this size? Like, wouldn't it be nice when that's just not the case anymore? Mm-hmm. And we force the objects to, you know, accommodate the aesthetic instead of the other way around. Um, you said it. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much for these uh, this evening and Harmony for this whole project. Uh, thank you as well, um, Claudia and uh, Ronnie and everyone here for attending tonight's venue. And I hope uh, we can continue doing these sort of things for a long, long time.